um, again, going back to the Learn Asia report, um, it talks about the Singapore Act. So it says that under the Singapore um, Act, a false statement of fact is defined as a statement that is false, uh, quote, false or misleading wholly or in part, and which a reasonable person would consider to be a represent representation of fact. Now, under the Sri Lankan bills, the false statement is defined as a statement that is known or believed by its maker to be incorrect or untrue and is made especially with intent to deceive or mislead, but does not include a caution, an opinion, or imputation made in good faith, or known or believed by its maker to be incorrect. So Learn Asia believes that this is a subjective criterion, and it's not clear how this would be interpreted. Could you? That's a great question. And I, in fact, I, I was thinking about this the other day, that the actual threshold for uh, determining that something is a false statement is a subjective threshold. You have to actually figure out whether the individual either knew or believed something that is false to be false before they made the statement. This is like the crowded uh, theater, sh screaming fire in a crowded theater in the yeah. US, the Supreme you have Court. To, you have to thing. know that there is no fire. Right, right. right. Because in, 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 in the uh, Singapore model, it doesn't matter whether you know or believe, it's whether a reasonable, a reasonable person, person thinks it's false, right? Uh, so, so here we've moved to a subjective criteria, which I think makes the enforcement of the law very difficult if it was to be enforced in good faith. That's the caveat, uh -huh. right? <laughs> if we are really concerned about the text of the law, then very few people will be prosecuted under this law because you're going to have to find out whether the person actually knew or believed that the person, uh, that, the, that, that, that the statement was false at the time, to get into the minds of the person. And that's an evidentiary issue. Now, that's only if we are serious about implementing the words of the law. And I'm sure every lawyer who represents every person who is suspected under this, um, this law will be, you know, sinking their teeth into this definition. Yeah. Because it makes the prosecution of any individual, I would say, very, very difficult. But the problem with the infrastructure that has been created under the law is that the, the, the Online Safety Commission can issue notices, can obtain conditional orders from a magistrate, all without any interaction with the person concerned. That creates a huge problem, right? Because you can only make a false statement if you know or believe that the statement is false. I, as the commission, can issue you a notice prohibiting you from that false statement or even get a conditional order where you have to comply with my notice mm. without ever interacting with you. Now, how, do, how does that work? So that's why many, many experts have looked at this law and said this is unworkable. So, I, I mean, in, in a way, you could look at it as a positive as well, because if the threshold is so high, not many people need to worry about this law, because all they really need to do is say, you know, we, we, we thought this was true at the time, uh, or we issued a, 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 a disclaimer that we are, we're joking or we're not serious, and immediately you get excluded from the scope of the law. Because if, I, if you look at all the offenses in the law, uh, all of them, are, I think, apart from cheating by personation, it has the, uh, the, the, the criteria or criterion of false statement within the elements of the offense. Right. So everything flows from the definition of false statement. So the fact that you picked on that is really important because it's a very subjective uh, definition. I suppose the final question, my guess, the final point would be about the society that we are part of. And I think, I don't think anyone can necessarily say they're a free speech absolutist. I don't know, maybe I might consider myself close to it, where I think generally words are words, actions are separate. So I, I mean, I'm of the view personally that you should be able to say whatever you want and the person you're saying it to can say whatever they want in return, right? So that's a certain type of society that yeah, maybe quite yeah. far removed from the society that we yeah. have in Sri Lanka. But is this sort of the fear that, that we have in our, in our country where maybe our leaders and the elders in society are quite worried about um, where we are headed in terms of, for example, with Natasha Dilsuria. Now, the joke that Natasha Dilsuria made was a very you know, slight, sleight of hand joke. It wasn't something that was so insightful, you know, insulting to the religion. But yet she, and this is, a, this is not online, she was still put in jail for a significant amount of time for base, making a very basic sort of joke. So does this online safety bill, 
in the context of the society we find ourselves in, what happened to Anas Jazim exactly for writing a book of poetry? What does this say about the overall climate of, of expression in Sri Lanka? And yeah. Is this the trajectory that we should be worried about more than perhaps, I mean, I know the, I know that there are things in the OSB that are specifically harmful and things we should worry about, but the overall trajectory is probably even more important, is it not? Yeah, I think that's a great point to end with because the, the danger of any kind of law, any kind of new law on speech in, in this country is not so much linked to the precise text of the law. Yes, we have to look at the text, and the text can be dangerous, the text can be overbroad, but the text can also be perfect. The text can be absolutely on, 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 on par with the best practice around the world, or best standard around the world, and still be a danger. And I think the danger lies in the selective uh, application of the law against individuals that you know a powerful actor may not like. And you do that, or threaten to do that a couple of times, uh, you create an enormous impact on the, the, the space out there in terms of free expression. You have a chilling effect. And I think the real danger, not just in online safety law, but any kind of law, is the impression created in the average user, average speaker, that you know now there's a new law that I have to be careful about. And I don't really understand this new law because it's so complicated. So I need to be careful now. And the criticism or valid legitimate concern I might have expressed uh, in the online space yesterday, let me not do that today because I have to be careful now. And that can be a viral type of fear that spreads throughout a society. And people are suddenly not willing to speak out. And our democracy is ultimately uh, hinged on ordinary citizens not only speaking out, but feeling the freedom and ability uh, that, that to speak out and to, to know that they have a right and ability to do so. Right. Without that, uh, you really can't hold institutional actors or political actors to account. And then the democracy starts to decay. So I think that is the bigger risk of any new law that is brought in. The complications or the sophistication of the law put aside, if people have a particular impression, people might hesitate to speak out, mm -hmm. hesitate to express themselves, uh, and, and then, then we have a much more serious problem. Well, Dr. Gehan, thank you very much once again for being on Insight with us and um, explaining the online safety bill. So as we said, it, it's all about the trajectory of our society and what kind of society we want to be in going forward. Uh, thank you very much for being with us on Insight, and we hope to see you again soon.